Excuse Call me. to order. <laughs> Minnehaha Creek Watershed District Board of Managers meeting for July for June 18th, 2015. All managers are present except managers Culkin and Shackleton. Um, and Manager Blixt is not at the dais, but is here. Is there anyone, any member of the public who wishes to address the board in a matter that is not on the agenda? I see no hands. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, we have one information item um, noted in the agenda. It's the 2014 flood damage FEMA update. Um, under the consent agenda, we have approval of the minutes of June 11, 2015, and three enumerated consent items, resolutions 15-053, uh, MPCA um, annual report, resolution 15-054, adoption of a rule policy for MS4 compliance, and resolution 15-055, Authorization to contract with Wink Associates for Mud Lake Sub Watershed Assessment. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Welch. Mr. Erdahl actually had his hand up first. <laughs> Mr. Erdahl. Um, I just had a few um, uh, minor edits to the minutes from uh, June 11th, last Thursday. Um, and I did send those electronically to Mr. Welch already, to Lewis and Mr. Welch. There's just um, uh, you can go through those real quickly. Just in the in the bottom of the approval of agenda, um, when Manager Shackleton talked about the new items for 11.2, I believe he was referring to both Six Mile Creek and Painter Creek sub watersheds, um, both of those areas, and not just one. Um, so that was one change. Um, and in the Citizens Advisory Committee update. Um, and maybe Manager Blix can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the meeting that was discussed, the, they, they discussed the meeting with managers White and Shackleton exploring more collaboration between the CAC and board. It wasn't um, to concerning a role. It was more about trying to increase the collaboration between the two groups. So I thought that might be a, a point to clarify. On line 144, it was just a correction of a word of, of should have been and. With 144 is no. Um, let me see here. Maybe it, my lines got shifted as I uh, edited. Yeah. It was uh, Manager Calkins also inquired about the ability to record planting successes and failures, not successes of failures. Interesting concept. Yeah. <laughs> 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 kind of. Uh, metaphysical, maybe. And then uh, there's just a T, the, the T on budget got dropped, so it said budge implications. Um, in the bottom of the section of 2016 budget process, it's talked about the board's engagement in a broad discussion of project priorities and budget implications. And then in further discussion of the, um, the matters brought forth by Manager Shackleton, again, just kind of changing the title of from Painter Creek Sub Watershed Water Quality to Six Mile Creek and Painter Creek Sub Watersheds Quality. Mm -hmm. And the same in the text there, um, when Mr. Panzer appeared before the board and the history of analysis to explore internal loading issues within the Six Mile Creek and Painter Creek Sub Watersheds. He talked about both of those. And then a quick, um, in the education outreach event concept, um, he stated that the district's fifth anniversary, actually that's 50th, of course. <laughs> Big difference. <laughs> and then in the administrative report section, um, when it talks about the Board of Water and Soil Resources at an event, it was actually, that will be um, recognized in its July snapshot publication. And then I just added in front of the REACH 20 project celebration, I just added a ribbon cutting celebration just to kind of more clarify what that celebration is. Are all of those changes um, acceptable as a consent item? M managers, Mr. I'd like to remove item uh, 6.2 resolution 15054 from the consent agenda, please. By leave. So the minutes as um, 
uh, corrected. I missed her at all statements and consent items 6.1 and 6.3. Um, I would move to amend the motion to approve the consent agenda with those changes. Is there a second to my motion? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those in favor of the consent agenda items say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Um, Who made the original motion? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Dick. Thank you. Oh. Uh, for President's report, I wanted to mention that for the um, meeting a week from tonight, there is a brief board meeting before the committee meeting. <coughs> I'm going to add an item to the agenda. I wanted to let people know so they could start thinking about it ahead of time. Um, <coughs> I want to just have a very quick discussion or a very quick discussion item to identify any issues that managers might want staff to consider for the 2016 work plans since they're presenting those work plans in July, but also to be thinking about um, any issues that might be planned for further ahead or thought of for further ahead so that, that during 2016 staff will be working on them bringing the committee process for 2017 possible work in 2017. So I just wanted to give people a chance to think about that for a week in case there are any ideas to be thrown out in advance of the work plans being contemplated. That's all I have. The upcoming meeting and event schedule is uh, listed in the agenda. We have no public hearings and no permits, so we will move on to item 6.2, uh, which was removed from the consent agenda. Mr. Welch. Thanks, Madam Chair and Managers. Very, very briefly, this was the item that the board reviewed last week regarding some policies that have been developed uh, collaboratively by staff, legal counsel, and the uh, engineer to address MS4 compliance at this kind of funny time in the um, planning process. We're not really ready for a full-blown rulemaking by any stretch, and this material doesn't warrant it. To be clear, in the, in the minutes for last um, week's meeting, there was a reference to the applicability of these policies and uh, Mr. Sorry, I don't have my red light on. <clears throat> Mr. Dietrich made the presentation and uh, was accurate in all regards. With one refinement that I'll add is that the policies will be up on the district's website with the other rules, so those who are affected by them will have ready access to them and they'll otherwise be distributed, and they will apply to all permits that trigger the associated rules, not just disturbances over an acre. So the policies actually apply more broadly than the state construction uh, stormwater permitting requirements. And that was a little bit unclear, so I just wanted to make that clear that they apply everywhere the rules apply and to all projects that the rules apply to. Uh, otherwise, there's no change. The uh, resolution was adopted and or is forwarded this month, there's no change to the resolution needed or any other change. Thank you for the clarification. Is there a motion to approve item 6.2? So moved. Second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> um, resolution 15-056, uh, we have Mr. Unmocked here to present. This is the clarification and update to the delegation of hiring authority to the administrator. President White, managers, uh, just a quick introduction uh, before I turn it over uh, to Dave. Uh, I thought it'd be appropriate to introduce the team. It's been a little while since uh, Springstead has been in front of the board. Uh, Dave Unmacht uh, has been working with us uh, since 2013 on uh, a variety of issues, uh, which we'll get into a little bit uh, later. Julie Urell, you may remember, uh, was last in front of the board for the comp and class study and has uh, really been uh, instrumental in the handbook update. Uh, Jen Charlo, Support Services Specialist, comes here every week, uh, also involved in both the policy as well as the handbook update. And then uh, we'll be touching on legal's involvement uh, on the policies as well as the handbook update. So uh, with that, turn it over to Dave. And Welcome, Mr. Unmock. Thank you very much, um, Madam President, members of the board. My name is Dave Unmock. 
good to be here. Uh, it's a place I'm familiar with, and I've been several times. We all have a role tonight, so um, uh, it, my, my role is to kind of kick it off and open it up, put context to it. When, when time and, and, uh, and effort has elapsed, board involvement, especially specifically, uh, there's a reason to kind of catch people up with where we're at and what we're doing and why we're here. Uh, especially with with the new board member who wasn't here when we kind of uh, originated all of this. So in, in February, and this will be relatively brief, but in February, March, April, and May of, of 2014, Springside was hired to do an HR analysis and a classification and compensation study. And we did that work and we presented the results of that to a board work session on May 29th, 2014 um, in, in, in one of your work sessions. And there was really kind of three things that we talked about. One was our findings. What did we find in our HR analysis? Two uh, was uh, uh, the structure. We handed out a, a draft structure. And three, at the time, the, the, the search was beginning. So we, we put together a process for the recruitment of the uh, of the district administrator and you reviewed that and you authorized us to proceed with that. The That went on its own separate path and so we're here back on the original work which was the HR analysis. The compensation classification work was completed and approved by you. The HR analysis and you see in the PowerPoint uh, slide was quite exhaustive and there was a lot of particular findings in of note uh, without detail. There was essentially seven kind of strategic observations and roughly six kind of tactical or day-to-day -day operations. In applying what we define as best practices, our own experiences, and also uh, a, a kind of a concept I use in my work called kind of premier local governments, um, we came up with uh, a couple major recommendations. And one, and this has to do with all of HR. And so one, two, three, I'm really gonna kind of identify four of them. And, much of the work that you see there is the implementation of these four concepts that we talked about in, in May of 2014. The first was role clarity. Where, what's the assignment of role for human resource services in the district? And so role clarity was an important finding. It was, it, there was not enough of it. Second was the organizational structure. Where does human resources fit within the structure of the district? And that was one of the reasons that led to the adoption in the in the development of this new business model or this business practice that you see up there referred to often as the hierarchy. And the operations and support services director function was the assignment of where HR would be housed both strategically and tactically with the district administrator overseeing all of it and the board obviously overseeing the role of the district administrator. Third was consistency. Consistency in policies and practices were lacking and a testimony was received from all of the staff, or the majority of the staff, I believe, and also in conversations with the Board of Managers. If you recall, I talked with uh, all of you, or attempted to, or certainly on the phone, to talk about your, your observations and your perspectives. And the fourth one, if you will, is the, in, in no particular order, was the fact that, that the work of human resources needed a higher profile, needed to be a higher priority, because we found uh, just gaps in things. And uh, so it, I also I remember coming before you in May saying that's not unusual. So what we discovered for this organization was not atypical of what we find oftentimes in other organizations with similar structure and similar organization. So you were symptomatic of what we often see in, in other organizations. What this organization did at your direction and your support was to tackle it. You said, let's take it on. Let's develop this in a better way. So the structure was approved. The HR audit took place. We had some facilitated discussions with the board of managers. The hierarchy was approved. That was integrated into the uh, into the search process. Then the new job description for the district administrator was approved as part of that, if you remember. You even had discussions about that on specifics that went into that. Um, adoption of the comp and class study, which is really Julie's expertise. The executive search, again, a part of it, but not it was a byproduct more so than anything. And then here, the employee handbook, which kind of brings us full circle to the, the details for tonight and what we're going to talk about here in a minute is the follow-up and the implementation of the specifics that come with the employee handbook. So big picture policy level for board rationale and board thinking <coughs> is the HR analysis identified both strengths of the organization and gaps of the organization. 
We created kind of a work plan and a structure to address it, largely driven by these three people here. I mean, I stay at a certain level, but these three are the, the workhorses who really put it all together along with the support of the, of the administrator, of course. Uh, and, and they're really making great progress. I mean, the, if, you, if you look back in one year in, in, in 19 days, May 29th to June 18th, uh, they've made significant progress in developing the HR function, assigning accountabilities and clarities, and making them a priority in the organization. So kudos to all the work that you've done. And tonight's about information sharing and about direction to complete really the final work of all of it. Um, and it's an, also an important update to ask questions about what's been done, what are the processes, and so forth. So credit to the board for the origination, credit to the staff for the work, and you've made great progress in your HR function in, in the span of one year, and it's good to see. So, questions about kind of the overall overarching thoughts, how we got here, why we're here, and what led to where we're going? Manager Miller. Um, I'm, I'm sure in the in classic uh, uh, public uh, administration, uh, this is all, uh, Critical they, they have, you know, everything written down. But I, I, I'm, I'm really f uh, fearful that we're going to turn into a bureaucracy, and uh, that we got a manual that'll that'll support it, and uh, we got all these policies in place that will uh, will ensure that uh, we're medi mediocre at best. Uh, and uh, what I want to I want uh, assurances from you. Because I respect all the work that you've done over the years in so, in so many places, uh, that we have the flexibility to be creative, uh, to uh, not create uh, pigeonholes and silos, and uh, and, uh, and not just rely on well, this is the policy, where we got some flexibility and some uh, we and we can reward uh, initiatives with more responsibility and. Uh, and, and I, do you get the kind of what I'm trying to get at? Um, Madam President, um, uh, Board of Manager Miller, so let's talk, let's break that out into a couple parts because in order to, to answer it, I think you have to. So there's two facets of what we're doing. The first is, is foundational. Organizations of this size and magnitude have to have the foundation of HR to be successful. One sidebar real quick. There are four things that make up a positive organization. There's administration, these are foundation, human resources, information technology, and finance. So when I'm invited to go into an organization and do an assessment, I don't get into the operations of the delivery of services, because by and large in most organizations they're really good. Where weaknesses are found in the ability ultimately to, to meet your mission, values, vision, etc., is in one of those four foundational areas. In this particular case, we studied HR, and it, it needed some things. And one of them that needed strengthening in the foundation. So you can do all kinds of good things, but if that foundation in HR isn't strong, it, that house is going to collapse on itself mm. in a variety of ways. Inconsistency, uh, employee issues, et cetera, et cetera. So what these folks are doing is they're putting that base in place. Now, here's the, here's the real answer to your question. Culture also is a preeminent factor in the delivery of what we're looking for. The culture of the board, the culture of the administration, the culture of staff. If the culture of HR is strong and innovative and creative, then policies won't block what you want to do. They're a means to the end. And you can have the flexibility to amend them, to adopt them. If you discover, and you will, that some of them might need some updating or some adapting or some changing, allow these folks to come in and say, hey, this isn't working for us. We need to do something different. But the culture of the organization drives that innovation and creativity more so than basic level policies and human resources. If you don't have those, you, you're, pardon the cliche, but you're kind of behind the eight ball on what you really need to have as a policy body. You need this organization to be strong there, but then you want to direct your staff, your council, and these folks to be creative and innovative. And if the policies are blocking it, bring them forward here for consideration. Got a good answer. We got to make it. We got to make it work. Yeah. Or another. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mr. Welch. I think that's a really interesting question and a, and a great question, and I have a bit of perspective on it because Mr. Mant and I talk on the phone pretty regularly about making the things that should be simple and that don't involve creativity easy and take less time, and thereby create more space. 
and a platform for creativity um, where you want to be creative in your programs, in your you know new concepts, uh, relationships with uh, other governmental entities, uh, landowners in the watershed, people who are interested in doing the kind of work that integrates into the, some of the new and very creative policies that the that the district is putting in place, and with all you know, with all due respect to everyone who's contributed so much to this, there's a lot of time spent reinventing the wheel in ways that doesn't that takes time away from that creativity, and uh, and I think as David Unmock pointed out, a lot of that has been locked down in HR over the last year, and and it, I agree, it's been a, a satisfying process to see because a lot of that wheel spinning and the asking the same question lots of times is going away. And I think it creates and facilitates creativity. Can you give an example? Uh, I can. Um, and it has to do with uh, a subject that is, uh, is directly related, which is you know turnover. And I think some of it has been because some of the basics that staff need to understand um, haven't been as locked down as they need to to feel like they've got that foundation underneath them where they can work. Um, an example, just off the top of my head, is there are <coughs> procedures that we've put into place, and <laughs> this is going to sound like more bureaucracy, but when you're taking enforcement action, it's very there's very specific steps, and council needs to be engaged. And uh, we've drafted, and David and I, and uh, Smith Partners, I should say, has worked on providing a framework so staff, when they get an issue, they get a phone call and somebody has filled a wetland somewhere, they don't have to sit there and say, what do I do? They go, oh, the enforcement protocols, okay, I can deal with this issue because I can go boom, boom, boom through my steps and I know what to do and I know who to call and I can address this problem quickly and efficiently and I'm not sitting there needing to start from scratch with a problem that this district has dealt with how many times over the years? Many, 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 many times. Um, as an example, David can probably think of more examples than I can. That's not something that's in the handbook. It's an example of, I, it, it addresses uh, Manager Miller's question in that there are things that ought okay. to be easy and ought to be locked down and that staff don't have to think about and be creative about they need to be able to rely on so they can do their jobs. Mr. Mann. President White, uh, managers, Manager Miller, I think a, a big uh, experience that has come forth uh, uh, was part of the original, uh, I think, understanding that was developed from the first meetings, and that's that uh, we need to develop simple materials and then we need to provide them to people, uh, make them readily accessible, and train on them. And so I think a lot of what we've tried to put forward are checklists or things that can be queued up electronically or in a paper version understood relatively quickly and then make sure that uh, uh, either there's someone in the department that's designated to understand that in the case of hiring or hiring teams or that we schedule the time and, and annually get together and say this will be a 20 minute uh, refresher and so we've tried to engage uh, a lot of good people to make great decisions and make it simple and easy to locate. Thank you. Are there other questions at this point, or shall we go on? Uh, just a quick Manager Olson. Would you characterize what you've done as um, adjusted the existing document or rewrote the whole thing? Have you rewritten it all, or is, is this a tweaking of what we had? The handbook? Mm -hmm. um, I think we'll, if we can get into that, I certainly can look at that now, but. Um, if I may, Manager Olson, can I come back to that? Sure. It, it's actually part of the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So I think if we can back up a little bit, just would like to uh, uh, just clarify initially what the objectives are for this evening. And um, I think, uh, number one, we would like to recommend that the board direct staff to work with the administrator, uh, Springstead as our uh, HR consultant and legal, and uh, finalizing the details necessary to roll the handbook out. Um, we also would like to reaffirm the board authority in approving any additional FTEs. Uh, so in essence, if uh, staff is proposing to grow the organization by a uh, staff member, uh, that should be a board process. And then lastly, uh, we would like to uh, recommend that uh, governance policy number four uh, be amended. 
And I think it's more of a, one of the small details that we've found, but there is a reference in the governance policy to the two department heads. And all the materials that we've been working on with Springstead talk about directors, so relatively minor change. Um, with that, uh, <coughs> focusing in on the handbook, uh, as Dave mentioned, we've really been uh, working on a lot of things as a team uh, going forward, but with the handbook, when we started out in 2013, uh, uh, the rationale as to why we started this was simple. The League of Minnesota Cities, as our insurance trust said, your handbook was last updated in 2004. This is a manual that should be an administrative tool, a manual that stays current with Fed, state, and local regulations. And then as the regulations change, the administrator has the flexibility uh, to work with consultants or, or legal counsel or whoever it may be to update this. It's, it's an internal operational manual. Um, so at that point, uh, uh, we, we looked at a few consultants and chose Springstead and, and uh, obviously said this is one of our priorities along with everything else that Dave highlighted uh, with the start. Uh, Springstead primarily had two roles in their original scope. One would be to look at the 2004 materials and compare them against state, local, and federal regulations. Uh, a lot of things have changed since 2004. So we wanted that to be a, a cornerstone of, of that, as well as best management practices uh, for government agencies our size. Vacation, sick leave, uh, a lot of the benchmarks <coughs> in the handbook, uh, how we govern uh, holidays, things of that nature. So uh, another uh, element we introduced with this is a concept of a three-legged stool. And uh, Michael and I commonly refer to that, but uh, the first leg of the stool was to review the governance policies and to make sure that those were all up to date and the Board of Managers approved the first leg of the stool in November of 2014. Uh, the second leg of the stool uh, was kind of uh, looking at the employee handbook and dividing what was currently in place. So the original 2004 document had a number of policies as well as what would be internal practices. And so we determined that uh, as we move forward with the third leg, which is program policies, we would take the policies out of the employee handbook, add an element called support services, and then put them in the program policies. So naturally we have reduced the size of the, of the handbook. Uh, we think policies should be where the board of managers can approve them in a policy handbook, not in an administrative manual, uh, staff's recommendation. And then reorgan uh, excuse me, reflection of the organizational structure. Uh, so as we were going through and looking at the new makeup uh, passed through the hierarchy of the comp and class, uh, reflecting uh, directors, uh, department heads, uh, delegation. Uh, we really wanted the manual in a lot of its uh, approvals and, and process to match the organizational structure. And I think lastly, removal of redundancies and outdated materials. Uh, there, was, there were some terms that were no longer used within the HR world. There was uh, some overlap with financial policies that had uh, in recent years been moved to finance policies, uh, which you'll see later this year, or in the case of uh, some, uh, we're actually moved into the governance policies, which were recently adopted last November. Uh, so yes, there has been significant change in the handbook. Uh, they've mostly been focused in these areas. And so um, I think uh, what you see in front of you uh, is a reflection of the work that Springstead has been working with staff, getting approved by the Board of Managers, as well as uh, what are key HR principles on the best management practice, state, local, and federal level. I have a question, Dave. Manager. Yeah. Um, in that process, did you identify a way to, or a, a system for making sure that in the future that it gets looked at at least on a biannual basis or a yeah. regular? <laughs> Thank you, Manager. Systematic way. Great lead in, Manager Brooks. Oh. Uh, again, one of, one, okay. of the, one of the key elements with the support services development and really all of the work that uh, Springstead has recommended that the district do across all programs, permitting, planning, uh, is uh, to try and have management training or to have training outside the field of natural resources. Uh, so we've started going to the League of Minnesota Cities trainings. One of the recommendations is how you keep these things current. Uh, the most, uh, <laughs> I guess the easiest way to do that is pull it out annually. And uh, this last year was a great indication. The state legislature got together. They had 
several minor modifications. Uh, uh, it was 2014 actually approved to be implemented in 2015, so we actually had the majority of the work done by Springstead, uh, learned about a few updates at the League of Minnesota Cities, and then had to put this project on hold, work with Springstead and Legal, and incorporate them into the document. So I guess the uh, lesson learned or, or the recommendation is to pull this thing out as often as possible, see, uh, check with the appropriate authorities, and make updates at an administrative level to keep the document fresh and functional. Well, I guess my, my question was, really, did you develop a way to ensure that that is done systematically? Like there is, like how we do other things that we know that we have to do on an annual basis. Can we incorporate it into our uh, calendar of events somehow? Mm -hmm. True. Sure, I guess the direct approach is uh, uh, we, we need to finalize this first and, and uh, get Springstead and, and legal in the room and, and roll the document out. Uh, the indirect answer is what they recommend is you pick the winter time uh, after or any time after the legislature is done or you're pretty much sure that a lot of the potential updates that have been or that could be expected are and then schedule the time. Um, so no, we have not uh, mapped that. Our, our assumption is that it'll be in the fall or early winter annually. Mr. Erdahl? I, I was just going to add to that, Manager, Manager Blix, that, um, that that's one of the reasons to coordinate closely with the League of Minnesota Cities, because they have a, a kind of extensive resources to track and follow all the legislation that might impact local government units like ourselves. And so then we can kind of, they can, they send out periodic updates and, and advisories on these issues and so we can kind of track those as well. And some of those will apply to us and some may not, so that's where we might need to, you know, get in touch with our legal advisors and, and kind of clarify some of those issues too. But So that's why I think that cl collaboration with League of Minnesota Cities is pretty important going forward for that specific reason, because they're looking at that on an, on an annual basis too. And I guess just to be very clear on the most recent occurrence, uh, when Jen and I went to the training, they provided a very thorough manual. One section of the manual at the loss control workshop said legislative updates pertaining to HR. They actually gave us the statute as well as potential uh, ways to incorporate it in your handbook, and then we, we sent it to uh, our Springstead and Smith Partners, and I think within a month had uh, everything uh, understood. So we assume we'll follow that process. It was very good the first time. Easy to follow. I definitely know somebody at the league now. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be uh, most efficient to add that in the, you know, getting ready for the annual meeting with all the other sort of checkup update things that we do for the policies to have HR at that time too. And you'll accumulate them over time, but then do them then. Mm -hmm. So you're not constantly pinging the Golden Gate Bridge, you know. But right. And President White, managers, I, I guess one, one other explanation just would like to make sure that uh, we really uh, have full uh, discovery on is the policies that are upcoming. Uh, there were a number of policies in this manual that are vital to the organization. Uh, information technology, for instance, was 04, and you can imagine with cell phones and iPads and all of the advancements, that's something that we would like to update and will bring back to the Board of Managers in fall or, or early winter with legal for a recommendation. Um, to be instance, vehicle policies, again, we've changed the way we buy, uh, the way we update, um, and everything along those lines, so vehicles, information, technologies, uh, a number of items that were in the handbook that we're going to actually put in a policy manual. And just Mr. adding Walsh. briefly, we'll also, that will be not, so those are the support services policies, and that will be their department, but you'll also see at the same time a, a compilation the last step is the, is the last leg in the stool for program policies. You know, I, I, don't, I don't want to be a dead horse, but the, the program services department, when did we form that? And, uh, you know, it sounds like we've got people bureaucratizing bur the, the organization. I, I know it isn't, but it, you know, let's try to avoid this, this kind of pigeonholing and uh, you know, the administrator will. We talk about a department. Uh, uh, what do you, what'd you call it again? Support S services. Support services department. Well, that's the administrator. Mr. Mand. President White, uh, managers. Uh, Manager Miller, one of the things that we've, we've heard from staff uh, in every department that they are really enjoying about what they're seeing is things that they don't really have time for, things that they don't really understand, or things that um, 
quite frankly, they're unfamiliar with, we're there to support them. So I think in its very nature, the support services department is working with every department. Uh, the budget is a great example where we're not telling them what to do or how to do it. And we're supporting them through the technology uh, and through uh, the process. And you know, I think that was one of the first things that was described as we were going through this process, whether it's finances, HR, uh, the building, our goal is to make sure that when the employees come in, they can. You're not going to talk me out of my position. You know, I mean, I'm, maybe, maybe it's not reasonable. I'm going to be pounding on it all the time uh, because we don't want a bureaucracy set up. It's too small of an organization, and we got too many new uh, uh, agenda items to, you know, well, that's not my department. Go to program services department, or, you know, I, I, I want this, this whole th everybody's committed to it. You know, moving the uh, organization ahead, of, and 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 if we get too uh, too departmentalized, I I'm really fearful that you know we'll be uh, well. I don't want to get <laughs> cite a bad example because it'll embarrass, it'll insult somebody, but we all know them. Uh, those kinds of organizations that turn into bureaucracies and the the the, the mission uh, the mission and purpose uh, gets uh, sideways to uh, to uh, creativity and and flexibility and flexed um, I'm just not sure that dick is referring to the royal we here because uh, I don't remember that we ever really decided it as a as a board that we didn't want to be a bureaucracy but um, and and I'm happy to have that discussion and and I may agree with him in the end, but I, I think it, it is something that we have to, we should, we, the group, um, have the dis discussion if that's something that needs to be decided upon. Fine. You know, you're more comfortable in a bureaucracy than I am. Uh, well, I don't you know, know about that. But I, 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 I'm, I, you know, I can come to a meeting once a month and pretend that I have something to say and that I'm making a, a, a contribution uh, or we can be engaged in, and have the, the staff uh, equally excited and engaged in the, in the mission or we can just approve everything that's done and nobody takes risks or uh, nobody is, takes on challenges because there's no in a bureaucracy there's no rewards for taking risks. I, let's, all I'm doing is challenging yeah. you that no, that's fine. That, I, that, that you I, that we glad. haven't just had that discussion yeah. and and you made it sound as though we all had yeah. agreed to what you said and I I'm just saying I don't remember what we ever even just okay. well there were we both, it was both probably, points yeah. noted both yeah, points okay. noted that's good um, this yes yeah. who what is support services. So, it, Madam President, mm -hmm. uh, board members, you're not creating a bureaucracy by the discussion tonight. Bureaucracies are created in many different ways. You, you are providing definition to an area that lacked definition. You are providing clarity to an area that lacked clarity. You are providing structure to an area that lacked structure. You are providing a framework to an area that lacked practice. It may sound like it because this is new. But this is basic element work in administration and fundamental development of an organization. Your employees need it. These leaders need it. You need it. Bureaucracy is created in many other ways. The best message you gave is to this guy and these folks here is, we want to keep this organization innovative, creative, and not be boxed in by, by policy. That's a cultural thing. That's a cultural thing. You can do all kinds of that notwithstanding what you're talking about tonight, but you don't, you don't have these things and you need them. And the administration of them then will ultimately be the determinant factor. But operations and support service were just created to, in this box here. So if you remember the district administrator, this is James Whisker's stuff, this is Telly's stuff, this is Craig Dawson's stuff, this is Dave Mann's stuff. Included in there are property and facilities management, human resources, information technology, finance and accounting, administrative services, and support services. So it's the organization of them with accountability, with accountability, with accountability that you didn't have before. Mm -hmm. And this was presented in May of last year. And you looked at it and you commented on it and you said it looks good. And we approved it later yeah. in the year. Yeah. 
you want an amendment? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so we, um, you are still talking about the, hand, the handbook, I think. I think, uh, the Madam President, managers, we're, we're uh, to a point where we can bring up the request for board action. And I think, uh, to summarize, uh, we're recommending that the board directs staff to work with the administrator in legal and finalizing the administrative details in the handbook. Again, uh, Springstead to a point where they feel that uh, their role is primarily finished. Uh, staff has been involved in those discussions. Uh, we'd like legal to help us make sure that there's not policy overlap to eliminate redundancy and, and quite frankly, do some cleanup. So that's uh, part one of the resolution. The second would be uh, some minor details. As we were looking at it, we obviously want to make sure that we can make this as simple to understand as possible. And uh, if you look at governance rule number four, recently adopted in November, there's a lot of mention of department heads. And our understanding is that the board of managers uh, has been involved with uh, director hires and up, uh, recently the administrator. So uh, there are two points that we would like to make reaffirming the board authority. Uh, one would be uh, that uh, the wording in, in number four would be changed to recognize directors, uh, not uh, department heads. We don't use department heads in any of our language, uh, job descriptions, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And second, that uh, there is language in the employee handbook, but not in the governance rules that talk about adding staff, growing the organization, uh, term full-time equivalencies. So to match the governance policies and make sure that everybody is understanding the same thing, staff is recommending approving the addition of any new full-time equivalencies uh, be reaffirmed as board authority. I have a question. I'll make the motion of this, but I have a question. Um, under B, is this board with direct staff and legal to draft? minor change and that come back to the board thank you with changing that one word i would move this rva is there a second second now discussion or questions again manager Blitz. just um so just so that i'm clear because i don't have the chart in front of me dave apparently has the only copy can um, when we're talking about the directors could you name those positions for me? Sure. James Whisker is planning and permitting. Um, Telegram Mike is communications and education. Craig Dawson's research and monitoring, and I'm operations and support services. So, in the event that any of those people resigned, if we pass this, then the executive committee would be the folks that would be um, still involved in the interviewing and, and decision making along with the district administrator. Is that the gist of what we're talking about here? Correct. Right. Uh, Madam President, uh, managers, Manager Blix, we, we feel that, and Michael, I don't want to speak for you, but in reviewing the governance policies, number one, number four, the delegation to the administrator, uh, even the interview process by the executive committee, those are all very clear, uh, or at least easy for staff to understand and, and sure. interpret. Uh, the word, again, the word uh, department head, we just don't have a job description. It's not mentioned anywhere. We're, so we're looking at past practice, and yes, absolutely, it would be directors or above. But I want to clarify what that, in, that governance policy, in fact, says. Uh, it's pretty fast in the paper, Mr. Uh, Welch. You will see it. The, the resolution, the RBA itself, I'm not sure the presentation here, but it does indicate in the resolution itself that's before the managers tonight that the uh, policy will be bring the revised policy forward for adoption by the managers on the consent agenda for July 9th. So it is clear that okay. that comes back to you for adoption. And we didn't want to do that tonight or propose that tonight because the managers could have decided to go a different direction, in which case it wouldn't make sense to change the policy we wanted to set the direction and the policy will come back to reflect what you tell us. But as Dave points out, Dave Mann points out, it would be those adding those two pieces uh, to really clarify the structure, which when we went to look for it, the structure was not clear, again to David Unmark's point, about what the delegation was, our, our goal was to clarify that with your hand. Resolution. Bring back the policy to reflect it, and I do want to point out that the managers still have in place, as and reaffirmed in its uh, November 
2014 adoption board district administrator relationship. I don't, we don't identify any change we're going to make to that. The board has also established certain policies in executive limitation number three regarding compensation and benefits for staff. That wouldn't change. So I think clarity is a great word because I think we're just putting down on paper something that pretty much is the way the district has operated today. Now people can go to it and say, oh, this is how we, it's been decided we don't need to rethink this again. And we all have the policy in our books in front of us that was also in the board packet. Yep. But just for clarification, the um, executive committee would interview the top candidates. This is only a part of it, but I'm pulling out a piece of this. Would interview the candidates, make recommendations to the managers on steps and the appropriate forum for further consideration of the candidates, and the district administrator would consider the recommendations that have been made to him. So that's the actual process that we approved in November. I mean, that was a reapproved from before, ratified, I suppose. Okay. So, uh, is there any further discussion or questions on the motion? I always believe that uh, good results uh, uh, are developed with tension and involved, so I'm not going to vote for this. Uh, because I'm, I'm going to try to figure out a way to uh, get a discussion going on uh, uh, bureaucracy. On bureaucracy, yeah. Uh, I, I, I think it's uh, it's so uh, worthwhile. Anthropologists would applaud your. Pardon? Anthropologists would applaud your position. Well, I I, I don't know if they would or not. But <laughs> they're, they're not occupying my spare time. So. <laughs> Are you ready to vote? Manage Blix. What we are doing is, in essence, forwarding it to the consent agenda on July 9th. Is that correct? The governance policy yes. revisions. Yeah, we would be authorizing um, the employment handbook to be completed, and we'd be bringing the rule change back, having it drafted and brought back for July 9th. And your the, policy the third answer. piece is that you're making the, affirming the existing delegation, as I understand it, to the administrator for hiring authority. Save those pieces reserved to the board. Yeah. Um, with the governance policies in place, yeah, with, there are yes. certain things he can't can't do, and there are certain things he needs to engage the executive committee for. But we didn't want to, you know, put too much bureaucracy around. It. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? I, I'm not voting. You're voting no or you're abstaining? Yeah, I'm abstaining. Okay. Four and, and zero. Second on that motion was um, per, per second. Okay. okay, thank you. I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you very you. much. And congratulations thank you. to you, Mr. Yeah. Thank Mark. you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you in that different way. As I do. Thank you. Thank you. How big of a bureaucracy do you have? <laughs> <laughs> so my it? last legacy with the district is a bureaucracy builder. How's that? <laughs> uh, we were talking about resolutions, and if, uh, uh, is this the right place to bring up something? Uh, this is the last place to bring up something. <laughs> okay. I'm bringing up something. Oh, right. okay. uh, about a year ago, we had a lot, big discussion about resolutions. Uh, and the staff was going to assemble all... Uh, David, uh, as the manager of uh, program services or whatever, you might want to be interested in this. Uh, we, about a year ago, we uh, had a resolution, had a uh, board concern about all the resolutions uh, that we had passed and because we decided that we were going to do resolutions rather than just motions or, or direction on the board mm -hmm. and uh, it was going to be assembled and uh, dated in back four years I believe is the number. I thought Lewis was working on that. Well uh, like uh, you know it's been a year uh, since we That's talked about it. So <coughs> who can give us an update? Uh, uh, Lars, what what we used to do is just kind of talk about stuff, and then the board would, or the staff would come back with it, and sometimes it wouldn't come back. So then we we point we did motions, and that seemed to be you know would be in the minutes and everything, and that that didn't seem to 
always work, you know, for, for a lot of good reasons probably, I don't know. And then so we decided to adopt resolutions, you know, uh, on things that we wanted to see done and, you know, uh, updates or whatever and all the various things. And, uh, and we've, we don't see, there's, we wanted the resolutions back for four years. So the, uh, 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 our legal counsel was going to uh, compile, them. compile them and present them. And, and it was about the policy resolutions, as I recall? Or? Yes. No, it was all, all resolutions. All, all resolutions. Was it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Rand. you're right. The policy, it wasn't the resolutions uh, for, uh, for hiring consultants or yeah. that kind of thing. It was policy uh, okay. of resolutions. Mr. Mand? President White, managers, Manager Miller, uh, to be honest, I'll have to follow up with that, and it should be a quick follow-up because uh, what staff did last year was go through and uh, create a summary spreadsheet of all the resolutions passed by the board, board of managers. Lynn Lewis asked us to pare that down to remove exactly what the board is talking about, resolutions that didn't seem to be what the board was requesting and then uh, was asked, then I believe we forwarded it down to legal. And so I know we have done three years. Uh, it was a pretty comprehensive search. I don't know if it went four, but I'll, I'll verify, check back, and, well, and what, Whatever the attention. resolution was for re reviewing the resolutions, mm -hmm. you know, it's three or four years, whatever. I don't yes. just like to see I'll, that uh, because check. it was kind of a, we were following it pretty carefully uh, about uh, having official actions, you know, and so it was in the minutes about things that we considered policy. I do know too that a lot of resolutions had not been signed or were out of order or something, and there was a great deal of effort put into that uh, with the former secretary of the board and Mr. Mand and other perhaps others. And Mr. personally, I, I, well, not speaking for Michael, I know when we talk about the three-legged stool, that's going to be an important document for us when we come back and have program policies in place for permitting, capital projects, everything of the nature. That's one of the easiest ways for us to find them: is what was in front of the board of managers, what was voted on, what was approved, and then. Um, That'll be a cornerstone, so I'll have to report that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Welch. I can just add a little bit, because yes, Lewis was pulling that together coming out of the retreat from 13 months ago. And one thing is this: the, that system is much more efficient and effective now, and those resolutions are tracked much better. Uh, Manager Rogers, as the secretary now, is signing those usually, I think, right at the next meeting, or the same meeting even, most of the time. So that system that you put in place where you look at a thing and you have your policy discussion about what should be done. You give staff direction, they come back having made changes to the resolution as the board directed, and it's done. That's working really well. And, and I think we're, we're keeping track of those things much better. Um, we have, I'm looking right now, tunneling into our system. There's a compilation of unsigned resolutions from 2013 and 2012 that's been completed last November or December it looks like so would managers like to uh, I'll follow up and find out you know what what would they to find out what format those can be readily you know, sent back to them you can see what, what they are. Okay. But they're I think it's done my understanding. How many are there? Uh, well they're in two separate spreadsheets and for twenty thirteen there are Not quite triple figures. There are 84, 83 <laughs> for 2013. For 2013, yeah, but the, 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 most of those are just administrative. They're not policy. No, those are taken out. The the ones that just like order blank to do a feasibility okay. study. Those are not. No, those are in there. Take it back. So there, that's all the resolutions from the year. So they haven't been paired out of there. That's a comp comprehensive list. <coughs> Thank you for asking the question, Manager Miller, and we'll look forward to that yeah. update. Um, it is time for the administrator's report. Can I, can I just, Manager Blix? Well, these two are still here. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask, of, I know at one time you were talking about getting an update to our iPads, and I'm, every time I upload my Dropbox, I am fearful it's going to crash on me or something. So I'm just, could you give us just a, an update on what's going on with that whole uh, process? Manager Blix, you're really good at setting up the next item because that was the first oh, thing on my oh. administrator's report. 
Oh, was the new going. iPads. Uh, <laughs> You've done that a few times tonight. Let's see, you're very, <laughs> very intuitive about what's coming up. So, and you, they can provide more detail if you'd like more, but we are going to have new I Apple iPads that will be available to the managers later this summer. Um, there are also some new technology software that's going to make it a lot easier for, um, for Jen to push meeting materials out to you, um, to your iPads, and, and manage that process a lot better. So, um, it's Dave and Jen have kind of been researching some of the, the newer features and, and availability of those things that is vastly different from when you got your iPads a few years back. Yes. Manager Olson. Keys are just going to disappear. Oops. Well, there's a, a couple different options, um, uh, Manager Olson. They, they may disappear, um, or, or we could sell them for their, their value or Actually, I think there's some guidelines we can't sell them, right? So we, we might redeploy them with research and monitoring or some other staff we might wipe them and use them for other staff purposes internally. Um, but I, there are some pretty strict guidelines in terms of how to dispose of um, technology materials in terms of uh, bidding process and, and posting them and all those different types of things. So we'll st follow state guidelines for um, disposing the We technology. can't sell them because? You know, Mr. Manager. President of White Managers, actually, uh, uh, we checked with the State Auditor's Office uh, on, on uh, most recently when Manager Rognes came on board, and it's very clear that we cannot resell them uh, to individuals. Uh, if we sell them, we have to put them up for public auction. And uh, we also have a policy that anything that has district data on it, we need to wipe clean. And most of the time, wiping clean means give it to our managed service provider and have it shredded and then receive a certificate back. Uh, saying that all the materials that were on this were 100% completely destroyed. Because when we got these, <coughs> they were described as being ours. Mm -hmm. And is that different now? That was a recent finding uh, with the recent appointments. That was the understanding we checked. Uh, and then our auditor said, I believe you need to check with the state auditor. I don't think government agencies are allowed to do that. Okay. which means we're going to have to uh, discuss that ahead of putting the technology policy together. How do we get rid of district hardware? On the staff side or an internal organization, we, we literally recycle and shred. Board of managers, the assumption was Where different. Cost? Where do they cost? Uh, $500 to $900 depending on the options. And you got to put them up for bid. They said... Uh, Technology is allowing for eBay, but still public auction. And they would resell for far less than that. That's for a new one, the 500 to 900. Mm -hmm. That's for a brand new one. These, what, what was the resale cost? 60 value, if, $60 value if we would trade them in. Yeah. Yeah. See, to, to any yeah. one of us, it's worth more than 60 bucks. And the other thing is that um, as you would have to shred government work, there is... Um, uh, it, 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 everything from albums to everything else that we have in here that we may want to shred too. So uh, I know I have got um, my company's correspondence coming through this all the time with my email and things like that. So, and uh, it's confidential in nature too. So I have to, it goes both ways. When they're destroyed, you get the certification back, right. which is some comfort. Mr. Man. President White Managers, like anything, we're, we're a lot smarter now than when we first rolled these out, and that's literally why the first step for us is to buy a tool called a mobile device manager. So we can assure whether it's your usernames, whether it's your passwords, whether it's the apps that are on it, whether it's how you buy things with our, our credit card, everything is internally controlled before it's rolled out. So receiving information is simplified for you. Personal use is simplified for you. Um, Apple has really come a long way, and they're teaching us that so we can... Uh, get that to you before we roll. And out. that capability didn't exist before. NSA's so, yeah. got copies of everything. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good but, this, is, this is a fun. We don't want to busy up everybody. This would be a great thing for support services to deal with, right? Yes. Yes. Good thing we have that group. <laughs> My yes. fourteen-year-old found a very effective way to wipe data, which is to take your iPhone and put it in Lake Calhoun. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to have rendered it completely unfunctional. <laughs> we could do, we could do that in Unveil different sub watersheds to try to to be more accurate. It's, it's not unfunctional. It's unreachable. 
it, it's there, yeah, but it's unreachable. Well, since we're very far off the field here, Kroll actually took those the, the data that was plunged into a swamp from the exploded uh, spaceship, I can't think what Space, it's called, yeah. and retrieved data from it. Okay. So they could maybe save your phone, your son's phone data. Not at a price I'm willing to pay. <laughs> <laughs> when you we, say that you're talking about shredding, you're not really literally... Electronic shredding. Uh, you're just basically going to... Um, Wipe it. Empty seven, it out. Seven wipes. Use and so the, so the <coughs> hardware would be usable for somebody else in the future. You know, so, so one of our other staff members could use this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's your intention, is that we'll just kind of clean it and recycle it to a, somebody internally. Correct. Is what you're thinking. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so when are you thinking this is going to happen? If all of the proposals come together, it's looking like August will be, uh, or early August would be a, an easy time to roll it out. If the mobile device manager, that's step one for us, uh, is delayed, uh, it'll be September. So we're talking late summer, early fall. It's in the budget, it's in the work plan. If I may, the, it'll be coming forward, managers. Um, I think in August we're going to bring it to committee. Right now we're working on having the MDM installed, so we're working with vendors. And the managed device or the uh, mobile device manager is basically a way that you're going to have your iTunes accounts separate so that your end user experience is better, but that I won't have to bother you to leave your iPads with me to download an app and I won't have to delete maybe your credit card information that you had in for your iTunes purchases, put in a district credit card to put a laser fee app. I can do it right from my desk, whatever apps it might be, and shoot it out to you guys and it'll just pop up that this is a new app and you would download it. So it'll make your experience a lot easier and it'll make upgrading everything easier and you can still keep your things separate, transferring from one device to another as long as you already have your your own iTunes account set up. Does that help explain it? We'll kind of walk through it further in August once we've got it all set up, but we're getting it in. We'll get it set up to get your opinion on what you might need for the iPads and then get it, them set up and roll it out to you guys and walk you through, train it. Bottom line, we won't have to spring the physical iPad in. Yeah, that's partly, I think, why not all of everybody is using laser fish at this point. Is it's hard to give it up for an evening or a couple of days, so it'll make it a lot simpler. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, but in the meantime, I should just assume that my Dropbox is going to keep functioning with the board updates. If you, Manager Blake, if you do run into any trouble, just email me and I can delete yeah. some information until then. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. I just have a few other quick updates. One is about the audiovisual um, system in this room. There have been some hiccups and problems with that for a while, and we're having the vendor address those and focus on those issues. And at the same time, um, they, Dave and others are also looking at alternative vendors if we can't um, get satisfaction from the performance of the system right now. Sometimes it will be up on YouTube and the video will be there, but there won't be any audio and some of those different types of things. So we, we just want to make sure that we um, get the system that we, <laughs> we ordered. So that's still in process. Um, a couple quick construction updates. Cottageville Park construction is on schedule and going well. Um, construction began last week on the Powell Road stormwater diversion project. Um, it, it should be completed by the second week of August. And then my last um, update is about zebra mussels and Christmas Lake, the process there. Um, we had uh, received uh, towards the end of this, actually earlier this week, um, the DNR had been uh, contemplating what size of a treatment area to treat um, this next go around. And um, they had initially talked about doing a much more localized section to where the uh, most of the zebra mussels were found again um, in a native mussel bed. Um, those native mussels were removed so they won't be impacted by the treatment. Um, but now that uh, they have taken our staff advice to do a larger area, about 11.4 acres, um, barriers should be installed earlier next week. It's going to section off actually most of that bay. Um, this is a, a black and white photo, but just to show you that the boat access is over here on the left and the barrier will kind of stretch across here. The topography of the lake is pretty um, uh, useful and for the, it drops off pretty quickly so we can make sure that it's not suitable um, zebra mussel habitat further out. And um, 
They're going to be treating it with potash um, a couple days after the barriers are in. It will be about a 14-day treatment period. The public access will be closed during that time. Um, we had a meeting in this room last night with the homeowners along that bay that will be impacted and won't have access to the lake. And the Christmas Lake Homeowners Association is working out kind of some temporary dock sharing at, at other spots so they can still have access to the lake. I don't know if anyone has any questions about that. I can try to. I worked closely with Eric and Craig in trying to um, kind of advocate for a larger treatment area. It was one of those things where if we're going to err on one side or the other, we we're hoping that we could go a little bit bigger instead of a little bit too small, otherwise have a, a forever missed opportunity to kind of continue this effort. Do you have an estimate on the cost of this effort? Um, yes, and it's a bit of a shared cost, and that's going to be developed. I think that, and, and Craig Dawson was explaining this to me earlier today, um, and it was already kind of budgeted for in in as part of, as the board authorized last year for kind of the initial treatment. So there's still funds available to, to pay for that. Um, but I think there's going to be a shared expense between the barrier and installation, which I think the DNR is going to order and cover, and then the actual potash, um, I think the district is going to cover. And Craig thought that would be somewhere in the neighborhood of twelve to $15,000 for about 17,000 pounds of potash. And after that initial treatment, there'll be a couple of bump treatments, but that's also kind of included to make sure they'll, they'll be monitoring the concentration of uh, potassium in, in the area to make sure that it kind of maintains a level that will be lethal to the zebra mussels. Lethal's good. In this case, are we adjourned? We are adjourned. Thank you. <clears throat>